Joining us now, our Canucks reporter, one half of the rink-wide duo with Andrew Wadden. It's Mr. Jeff Patterson back with Sakarison Price. Jeff, how are you? I am doing all right, guys. I'll ask you the Bodog poll question to start here and get your comments on the young man making his NHL debut last night. Should the Canucks have started Arthur's Siloffs? Uh, all along, I was in the no camp. Now, it went fine. He survived, and he's got a baseline, so no harm, no foul, ultimately. But if you were asking me if it had my, my decision, I would have kept him away from this entire environment altogether. This is a guy that's 21. He doesn't turn 22 until next month. He's a 2019 draft choice. I think there were only four goalies out of that draft class that have touched the NHL already, which kind of gives you an indication of the developmental curve of goaltenders. One of them was Spencer Knight, who was in the top half of that draft class in the first round here in Vancouver, and Peter Kachikov, uh, who's become a nice story in Carolina, and he was a second rounder. So uh, to get a sixth rounder already into the National Hockey League at 21 years of age, like that shows that Silovs has come along and, and he's had a nice season in Abbotsford. I still think for me, if you were going to bring him in and be the backup, and I saw people say, oh, give him an NHL paycheck, he's getting the check, whether he's the backup on the bench or in goal. I'm a believer in putting guys in positions to succeed. And I think throwing them into the fire against the New York Rangers, the way that they're playing, again, it'll give him a baseline of seeing and facing some truly elite talent on the other side. I just think if you were going to bring him in, why not give him a night to watch the NHL from the bench, a couple of practice days, and then play against a much lesser opponent, the Philadelphia Flyers, on Saturday. And Thatcher Demko has said, oh, he thinks he's going to be ready to back up on Saturday. They just bump that back a little bit, back back it up one game. Don't activate Demko off the injured list. So, you know, I, I think, in my mind, that's the scenario I would have seen for Arthur Silovs, but he came through it. He was fine. He's got the Canuck experience. Now he gave up five, so he's officially a Canuck, and uh, <laughs> that's just kind of the way it works. So, uh uh, you know, I hope that he takes the experience here and he and Ian Clark can sort of process it and break it all down and give him some things to work on. But uh, again, if uh, you're asking me, I, I would have delayed it by a game if I had given him a game at all this season. It's funny, there's not much difference in the end between the goals against of Mikey DiPietro and that infamous start in this one. Um, uh, the Canucks scored a little bit more in support, but uh, other than that, I mean, um, you know, it's you do walk that fine line. It did, didn't feel like he was being caved in, uh, but hey, he did let in five goals. Yeah, and I've seen lots of people try to draw a straight line through from DiPietro to Silovs. And of course, DiPietro was a junior age goaltender on an emergency recall because the organization didn't have any other options. Uh, they made the choice to bring Silovs in. He's been playing pro. Uh, has had a nice run down in Abbotsford, so he is further along in the developmental curve than Mikey DiPietro was. And, of course, when Di Pietro got thrown in against the Sharks and it didn't go well for him, uh, you know, he handled it like an absolute pro. And, and all these years later, I still give him credit for, you know, the way that he handled that and tried to take the positives. And it's a game in the NHL. That said, I'm sure Di Pietro thought this will be the first of many in the National Hockey League. And, of course, uh, who knows where his career goes from here. But uh, the few other op- or opportunities that he's had, he has yet to deliver a victory. So, Mikey DiPietro may never get an opportunity to actually land a win in the National Hockey League. I hope for Arthur Silovs that, you know, this is one and done, I think, for this year, because Demko, Demko's knocking on the door of getting back in. But certainly Arthur Silovs profiles as a guy that will go back to Abbotsford, continue to be the lead dog in a good environment. Hopefully they can get on a nice playoff run and, and have some success in the postseason. And he is still viewed by the organization as a piece of the future here. So I think we'll see Arthur Silovs more. Uh, but in my mind, I, you know, I don't need to see him again at any point this season. Uh, you know, just take this, run with it, and be back and, you know, ready for training camp next year to try to show the organization how far you've come along. That's uh, That was sadly what afflicted Mikey DiPietro. He got a little big for his britches when he got back, and you hope Arthur Silovs doesn't think he's made it right, uh, you know, because getting to the NHL should not be a finishing line. Uh, it should be a starting block. Um, let's move on to injuries on defense. You know, when you see OEL leave the game like that, Jeff, I just wonder the, the merits um, of playing Luke Shen right now. Um, whether or not we're getting to the point now, especially with such a physical defenseman, he's there blocking shots towards the end of the game and whatnot. Is it time to put Shen in the press box until you make a decision one way or the other? 
Uh, yeah, and let's be honest, this has not been a great week for Luke Shen. He and OEL were dusted by Detroit on Monday night on for four of the six Red Wing goals. And then I think Luke is still looking for Vinny Trocek on uh, what turned out to be the 3-2 goal when he just absolutely walked him. Uh, and amazing that Trocek didn't score, but the sequence works its way back to the point, and then the deflection and the double deflection, and in it went. So uh, a bit of a tough go. Now, I don't think in isolation one game is going to change the opinion of acquiring teams around the league, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you do wonder a little bit uh, in terms of asset protection if it's going to be a bit of a struggle here. And remember, it was a week ago that Luke Shen, that the game at Madison Square, barely played the third period, standing at the bench, and then he didn't play the next night against the Islanders. So, you know, is he playing through something? Is his uh, performance this week an indication that maybe he's not at 100%? So, yeah, I mean, if, if the team has made up its mind that it is going to move on this player... Uh, this close to the deadline, then sure, because you're right. You saw, I mean, OEL was a freak-looking play. I mean, pretty innocent along the wall, a play that happens 100 times in hockey, and OEL left and was never seen again. Uh, and the same thing could happen to a guy like Luke Shen. So, yeah, we're seeing it around the league. Uh, it's not really working for Arizona right now. They're sitting Jacob Chikrin, and all they're doing is winning hockey games, which is uh, sort of ironic because, of course, now they're tied with the Canucks in points, which is just an incredible statement to make when you think of, uh, the outset of the season, and the Coyotes were all in on Connor Bedard, and the Vancouver Canucks had aspirations of the playoffs and being capped out, and here these teams are uh, tied in points, and they still have two head-to-head matchups, by the way, at the mullet uh, down in Arizona, so uh, big games uh, ahead for the Vancouver, including Game 82. It's the Canucks in Arizona. Wouldn't that be something if that came down to uh, playoff or you know draft lottery seating? Uh, whatever the case, sure, I'm, I'm ready. The the only thing I suppose is that yeah, Travis Dermott, uh, I don't know about his status moving forward here. He's had a relapse, and it's just been such an unfortunate season for him. He's played all of 11 games, missed the first half, and it sounds like he's had a setback with the same head injury that kept him out for the first half of the season. So, you know, he's not available to them. And you've got Kyle Burroughs who could plug in and play, I suppose, but uh, maybe it's time to dip back into the farm and whether that's give Christian Willannon an actual opportunity in the National Those Hockey League. Those are two league. or three-point night last night for him. You yeah. know, Jack Rathbone is there if uh, they're trying he to... He scored last night. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, they do have some options, and, and I'm all for it. I mean, look, if you're going to plug a raw rookie goaltender in at this stage, I think you've signaled, you've traded your captain away, you've shut down Ilya Mikheyev. Uh, if that's what it means, that you've got to bring more guys up from the farm, then so be it. But, yeah, I mean, it probably feels like it is time. You don't want to miss the opportunity to be able to trade Luke Shen, and you'd hate to see that derailed by any kind of injury this close to the deadline. Not that I expect you have the answer to this, because we didn't know uh, McCabe was really battling anything um, significant. But I, I, I do wonder, do they shut anybody else down that has op- optional surgery coming up you know, is that the way to, again, structure a tank a little bit for the Vancouver Canucks uh, going forward? Because you do want to offset. Like, I think Thatcher Demko is going to improve their save percentage. He is. And, and if if you're going to be this bad, guys, you have to make it worth your while, right? Like, if you're going to be this bad, there's just no point in finishing 24th in the NHL when you've got an option to finish 28th or 29th, right? So uh, I do wonder if we see one more of those, and I mean more significant than even Travis Dermott. Yeah, it's possible, and you're right, uh, you know, without knowing that yep. that's what Mikheyev was facing, it's hard to know. I mean, if guys are playing, clearly they have the green light to be in the lineup at this stage, but lots of guys are playing through lots of things, and so maybe after the trade deadline, perhaps we get a better sense of, you know, yep. who's who and, and who's available to the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, on the Demko front, like, I really am fascinated because they've got 27 games remaining, and he's not supposed to play on Saturday, although if you're the backup – and you're in uniform, you're one knock away from getting thrown in there. But let's just, for the sake of this argument, say that he doesn't play Saturday. 26 games to go. You know, any more than 15 starts for Thatcher Demko over the final 26 just, to me, would be negligent on the part of the organization. Like, this guy's coming off a serious injury now. And, of course, his performance early in the season, I think, was directly related to whatever perform- or whatever procedure he had uh, at the end of last year when they had to shut him down. So don't overwork him. You know, figure out a schedule. And Ian Clark, I think, is pretty good about these types of things. You know, space out the games. Give him lots of rest and recovery. Again, the results mean absolutely nothing. So whether it's Colin Dealey that sticks around as the backup, whether they bring Spencer Martin back as the backup, 
give Thatcher Demko enough of a run to feel the puck and, and feel like he's back in the National Hockey League, but don't for a second think that there's a result that matters enough that, you know, he has to play on a certain night. Uh, I think they really have to be careful uh, with the way that they handle Thatcher Demko over the remainder of the season. Where are you on trades, Jeff? We've heard JT Miller's name now today, mm-hmm. as well as Nils Hoaglander. And uh, do you anticipate that things are going to get busy here? Dreger told us yesterday the market is locked, but do you see the Canucks being active as we get towards March 3rd? I've always kind of set the bar in my head at three, and Bo Horvat's one, so that's one off the board. I anticipate a Luke Shen deal. And then, uh, I mean, I guess I set the line at two and a half. And to me, I, I would expect that, yeah, I mean, there's been enough smoke on Brock Besser, but he, he remains a Canuck, and we know that his agents had permission to shop him around, and people have suggested that the Wild and the and the New Jersey Devils have certainly kicked tires at the very least. And so, uh, again, I think if Brock could have a – uh, a little bump here in his production and the fact that he's playing with Elias Patterson for the most part right now, although he and Kuzmenko swapped out last night because Kuzmenko was was going. But, you know, if Brock Besser can have a little bump and a little bit of pop in his production, I, I still think that there are teams out there that think they'd be buying low on a player and maybe a change of scenery uh, would produce what they're looking for from him. So, uh, yeah, I'd keep a pretty close eye on uh, a guy like Besser. And then beyond that, I think it would have to be a surprise and – you know, would Connor Garland moving at this point be a surprise? It wouldn't be a huge shocker, but uh, his name doesn't seem to be out there an awful lot. But sometimes those are the deals that get done, right? That uh, mm-hmm. I mean, we know that the Canucks, uh, I think, would would look favorably on on moving off that salary. Uh, beyond that, you know, depth pieces, I suppose. Like, would there be an interest in Kyle Burrows as a right shot? depth piece he's barely played on this team and barely been able to get into this lineup uh i do wonder if other teams would value that but we know that teams that have uh, designs on going deep into the playoffs you can never really have enough na- you know national hockey league defenders so um mm. i mean i like kyle burrows and the effort and the hustle and he gives you what he can but again he is very much a spare part here in vancouver i think if you could turn that into an asset that that's something that you'd have to look at you'd be looking at a late round draft pick there but it's giuseppe think- as well right uh the way he's playing and the way talk is talking about him uh whether he's a depth piece for a team i'm glad you brought up kuzmenko well hang on a sec before i get to kuzmenko Trading Phil D. Giuseppe, he's going to be the next captain of the Vancouver Canucks. The exactly. way the pocket is treating this guy, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the next captain of the Abbotsford Canucks. Um, can we all say Kuzmenko and the way that Talkett has handled him? We're all good with oh that now. Uh, Seems no. to have had the desired no. effect, Blake Price. If you checked his stats on the season, Matthew, this is just what he does. Actually, he he'd never gone more than four games without a point anyway. Battlefield oh, promotion just, last night, as Jeff outlines. Maybe the talk guy knows what scorer, he's doing. If he was a six player. goal, sixteen point guy, then yes, he would get credit for. Does he get credit for finding the twenty two goal guy? No, this is what he's been doing. Jeff, play judge and jury on this one. I, I do like Rick Talk's honesty and, I, and the fact that he said, like. You know, Kuzmenko has been the first guy into his office almost every day. And the fact that Sergei Gonchar is around right now, and I know Gonchar is a defenseman, but he's also a Russian. And it, it does feel like he has bridged that gap of communication a little bit. And he says Kuzmenko's in there with uh, the iPad and, you know, on the whiteboard and asking all sorts of questions. So, you know, it, this, there, I think there was an element of tough love last week out on the road trip, but it does feel like these two guys are on the same page. But to Blake's point, and I think I am siding with Blake, that even though the coach kind of, you know, put him in a tough spot by parking him on the bench and dropping him low in the lineup, the skill level is still there. That didn't go away. That is under Kuzmenko. We saw that under Bruce Boudreaux. We've seen it. I mean, the goal that he scored in New Jersey when he walked around Dougie Hamilton. And then last night, like, that move that he makes in tight. Like, there is no space. We talk about guys, you know, he can stick handle in a phone booth. Like, truly, for him to be able to pull the puck in the way that he did and roof it uh, would have been a spectacular goal. Unfortunately, it banks off the crossbar and Garland puts it home, so it's an assist. It was a spectacular assist. I, I, I think you give him enough leash that he's going to put his skill on display. All of that said, though, if you watch what turns out to be the game-winning goal by Keandre Miller, Puck is rimmed around behind the Canuck net. Jacob Truba moves up the right-wing boards, and Kuzmenko goes over, and for all the talk that Rick Tockett has mentioned here about wall work and board battles... 
Kuzmenko doesn't get engaged in much of a board battle there. And then Truba has time and puck winds up on the stick with Keandre Miller and, and they score. So, you know, there was good in Kuzmenko's game, but I still think that there's the room to grow under the eyes of the, this head coach. And there'll probably be another video session, uh, some of it the good, but also some of it the things that uh, the coaching staff still needs to see from him. Nevertheless, Jeff, it was the benchings that got him in early working on the iPad with Sergey Gonchar. So I'm going to give Coach Tuck. It's not a finished product. Rick is not done benching this player yet. But ultimately, he's going to be the better for it. Son, you'll thank me when you're older. If I roll my thing. eyes anymore, they will leave my cranium. That's, uh, that's what's happening right now. Well, on that note, then we'll end it, Blake. We wouldn't want you to have to go through some sort of I gotta find my eyeballs ocular the incident here uh, with J Pat. Jeff, thanks for this. We'll catch up next week, buddy. All right, guys, thanks.